Hi gang. Slightly more serious video topic today. I'm going to be talking about humans' tendency towards self-destruction. So if you'd rather skip that discussion for today, you are welcome to come back to this video at a later date. One of my favorite memoirs, and indeed one of my favorite books, is Wasted, a memoir of anorexia and bulimia by Maria Hornbacher. As a young woman, Maria was intelligent and ambitious, uh, a writer, she's driven and, and clever, and pretty messed up about food, among other things. And if you're messed up about food, if you struggle with disordered eating or with their forms of self-destruction, I'd probably recommend skipping this book as it can be pretty triggering. But when I was a teenager, I read it again and again and again. Maria in this book manages to put into words feelings that I have felt for much of my life. Whether or not I felt them as intensely as she did, maybe I just felt lesser shades, I could still relate to what she was saying. I'm going to read a few passages because I want to zoom in on one particular idea, and it's a question. Why do we hold on to habits that we know are bad for us? Maria struggled most as a teenager, but in this memoir she says she was never normal about food. Her eating disorder just became a part of her when she was growing up. So at one point, she's in this facility, Low House, and she says, By the time I got to Low House, a horrible paradox was running my life, and to some extent runs it still. My only means of self-regulation was self-destruction. To give up a long-standing eating disorder, one that has developed at precisely the same pace as your personality, your intellect, your body, your identity itself, you have to give up all vestiges of it. And in doing so, you have to surrender some behaviors so old that they are almost primal instincts. I had to give up the only tried and true way of handling the world that I knew, turning instead to things untested, unproven, uncertain. I am a suspicious person by nature. I could not simply take as gospel that I would someday learn to live without the eating disorder. I was not absolutely certain that I could do it. I had no normal life to return to, no prior experience of eating normally, being healthy, so I kept the eating disorder as backup, just in case. That was a mistake. There was a point when I was in university and I was struggling with anxiety, so much so that it got to the point that I knew I needed help. I didn't know what kind of help that I needed, but I knew that I needed some kind of help. The thing I ended up doing, the thing that ended up working, was to take this mindfulness-based stress reduction course. I did these like eight private sessions and we would do breathing exercises, we would practice um, changing the way that I think, we would do walking exercises and yoga, and I would also just talk about what was going on in my life and what was making me anxious. All of this was really helpful and necessary, but one thing about doing that course is that I realized I was reluctant to let go of all of my anxiety because it felt like it was a part of me. Another thing Maria says in this book is that we tell stories about ourselves, and the story that I had been telling about myself was that I just was an anxious person, that it was hardwired into me, and it was my only way I knew of looking at the world. So as I became less and less anxious, it actually started to get kind of scary, the, the feeling that if I let go of all of my anxiety, I was going to lose some vital part of me, and I wouldn't know who I was anymore. And listen, when it comes to, you know, anxiety, some anxiety is, is normal and necessary and good for you, but anxiety that has you crying in your car before your shift at work, anxiety that has you skipping classes or canceling plans with friends is not helpful or productive anxiety. And so at one point in her recovery, Maria talks about how she was making some progress, stepping forward, building relationships with people, but she says, for all that, I was not wholly convinced that I would be able to go on without an eating disorder, so I didn't throw myself headlong into recovery. I think I had the idea that if I could just get a little happier, my eating disorder simply wouldn't matter anymore. Maybe I could just have a moderate eating disorder when I got out, but not be so miserable. Just diet normally like everyone else. Good luck. Basically, this is the equivalent of a binge drunk attempting to be a social drinker, or, as I recently ludicrously attempted, a three-pack-a-day smoker deciding to smoke only at parties. 
Of course, it was utterly terrifying for me to relinquish, even for a short period of time, some token eating disordered behaviors. What if I forget how? What if, God forbid, I completely lose all control and decide not to want to have an eating disorder? I pictured myself, as we say in our catty little culture, letting myself go, messy haired, laying around, being relaxed all the time. And so when I say I wanted to hang on to a part of it, what was I hanging on to exactly? Well, <laughs> one of the things I would do is I would drink coffee, I would drink caffeine, knowing that that made my anxiety worse. It would make me feel jittery and, and buzzed, but the feeling was familiar. Like there was something almost comforting about, about feeling that heightened anxiety. Other anxious habits that all of us might indulge in would be things like doom scrolling, you know, clicking through news article after news article that's just serving to stress you out and freak you out. They're behaviors that reinforce that anxious feeling instead of attempting to address it in any way. But if it's just a little thing, you think I can keep that peace. I don't have to give up on doom scrolling. I mean, that's not a big deal. I don't have to give up on drinking coffee. Everybody drinks coffee. Just because, you know, I react to it differently doesn't mean that I don't get to have coffee. I did other stuff when I was a teenager, found other ways to be mean to myself. Um, there was definitely some of that around food, calorie counting and not bringing a lunch and not accepting any, any treats that anyone would attempt to give me. I remember going out with friends, you know, we walked to McDonald's on their lunch hour. And um, I was walking with this group of guys and they went and they just sort of got fries from McDonald's, whatever. And uh, one of them was like, here, you're going to fry? And I said, no, nah, no, nah, because I didn't, uh, didn't eat during the school day. And he was like, one fry, just have one fry. And I think back on it now and I wonder why I couldn't just have one fry. Like a boy that I liked was offering me a French fry and I love French fries. You guys, I love French fries. And I wouldn't take it. I had made this habit out of uh, denying myself things that I wanted because I thought that it made me strong or made me, I don't know, on the one hand you want to be invisible, on the other hand you want to stand out. Like it was both those things at the same time. And you do this stuff, I did this stuff in part because I was unhappy and then you start to get happier and you don't give it up. You think, but I, I need it. I can, be, I can be normal. I can totally be normal, but I just need to keep doing this one little innocent thing. Because by that point, there are habits and you're alive and you think, well, maybe this, this works. Um, as I said in my, in my self-keeping video, when we have coping mechanisms, we, we sometimes beat ourselves up for them, but the coping mechanisms are the thing that is helping you cope. And I think that for me, some of those little behaviors there were things that I did to stop me from doing something worse. And so you think, I can get better, I just need to hold on to this one little thing because it's your backup plan. So I've got one more quote to help make sense of all this. And it goes, it goes like this, it's later after Maria has gotten out of Low House. Um, and she says, I thought sometimes about the day in Low House when I'd sat at the window and realized I had to give it all up. I knew very well that I was not giving it up. I was hanging on, as so many of us do, to some small part of it. To a part so small it seems a mere token. Nothing dangerous, a talisman of sickness kept in the pocket, rubbed between finger and thumb. I told myself it would be all right, just hanging on to this little bit. And I knew, in the back of my mind, that it would not. I have given up on a lot of my teenage habits. But there is still one habit that I have that is not good for me, um, but feels like it's a part of my identity at this point. And that is my procrastination. I am a chronic procrastinator. I always have been. I procrastinated all through my high school experience, which was made worse by the fact that I went to a self-directed school. So you really could put everything off until the last semester. I procrastinated all through university uh, to the dismay of my professors who are all very kind and very accommodating. And I find myself procrastinating now in my adult life. When I'm really anxious, I enter what I call avoidance mode, which is the tendency to avoid doing the thing that is going to make me anxious. 
and I might do lots of other things, I might be very busy, or I might just be sort of lying catatonically in bed, but I am avoiding doing the thing because I'm avoiding the feelings that I think will come along with doing the thing. And I know that it's a problem, and I know that avoiding the thing it does not make the anxiety go away. I mean, it does for a little bit. You get this like tiny little temporary relief when you're watching Grey's Anatomy or whatever, but you're not addressing the problem. And in fact, the problem's probably gonna be worse when you get back to it because you will have wasted all of this time. And at one point, things got really rough and I was trying to explain what was going on in my head. And I distinctly remember that at one point I was saying like, maybe I'm just not built around schedules. Like schedules and routines just don't work for me. And if I could only find a life that would allow me to procrastinate, then I could fix it, I could do it, I could be happy. As if I could somehow fix every other part of my life and not address this one bad habit. Like I could just hold on to this, this one token of a thing, this thing that allows me to feel safe for a fleeting instant and still manage to do everything else. I do think that a lot of us have one bad habit or maybe a couple bad habits and we think I can just live with this. Like I can, I can fix everything else and if I can fix everything else, then this one thing that I do won't matter. But you know what, gang? While I may never be able to completely kick the procrastination habit, I think that if I, if I give into it, if I think that it's okay to just hold on to it, I'm never gonna accomplish the things that I really want to accomplish. Because there's a lot of stuff that I wanna do and if I just keep treating deadlines like they don't matter when the real world has deadlines, then I'm, I'm never going to be able to submit a game to the interactive fiction competition or to get a story into a literary magazine. I don't think we can treat our bad habits like they are an immutable part of us, something that cannot be changed. But why do we do it? Why do we hang on to something that we know is no good? When I was a teenager, it was this. It was that I wanted to know that I had a way out. There's this deeper part of me that gets afraid of responsibility and longs in some ways to fail. Like there's some part of me that says, if I fail, if I just explode my life, then maybe everybody will leave me alone. Then maybe people will cease having expectations of me and there will be no way for me to further disappoint anyone and I can just live in my shame spiral. I think sometimes we hold on to bad habits because we're holding on to a way out. The bad behavior hanging on to is the, the crack, the flaw that you know that you could exploit to shatter your whole life. But most of the time we don't do it. I haven't done it. I am still trying to work through my procrastination and through <laughs> anxiety, brain, and all of the other stuff that makes it hard to be human sometimes because working towards a good and full life will sometimes mean dealing with the parts of yourself that don't want that life, that are afraid of that life because it's hard, because it would be easier to just fail. So I'm sorry if this is a little bit of a downer, but I wanted to get some of those thoughts off my chest. I have been filming for a long time, so um, sorry editing me, but a journey has highs and lows peaks and valleys. I want to share the whole spectrum of experience of being alive with y'all. And well, friends and fellow Betsies, I will see all of you tomorrow.